I'm Mary Crocker and I'm one of the ASP fellows for the summer. And then this is our panelist, Rondell Trevino. And I'm just going to read off a quick bio for him before we get started so that y'all know who we're talking to. So Rondell is the founder and director of the Immigration Coalition, a faith-based nonprofit providing clean drinking water to immigrants and migrants at the southern border and biblically balanced resources on immigration that show compassion to immigrants and respect for the rule of law. Rondell speaks on issues of immigration and engaging in politics from a biblical perspective at churches, organizations, and conferences around the United States. Rondell has written and been featured in several publications, including the Gospel Coalition, Christianity Today, and the Washington Post. Rondell is the author of the book, Anticipating the Birth of Jesus, an Advent devotional on immigration. Rondell received a Bachelor of Arts in Biblical Studies from Belhaven University and a Master of Divinity from Capital Seminary and Graduate School. Rondell is happily married to Laura Trevino and is the proud father to Sophia Trevino and Charlotte Trevino. All right, so with that, I am ready to ask my first question, which is, um, I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit more, Rondell, about what you do at the coalition. It, you know, you described a little bit in your bio, but um, if you could tell us a little more about what you do every day. Yes, well, well first, let me say thank you, Mary, for uh, moderating this, this panel and, and to the American Solidarity Party for just allowing me to, to join and to talk about this complex issue of, of immigration. Um, and so, yeah, like, like you said, uh, the Immigration Coalition, I'm the founder and director. We provide clean drinking water um, to Latino immigrant, migrant, and asylum seeking communities along the southern border. Um, along the southern border, there are around 13 million plus Latinos, immigrants, migrants, and asylum seekers living on both sides of the border, uh, it, living in what in Spanish is called a colonia, which is neighborhood in Spanish. And they are labeled colonia because what it means is um, it means that they have, uh, they're very underdeveloped and have uh, hardly any resources uh, at their disposal, uh, food, clothing, uh, and including water. And so as an organization, we believe in calling our representatives, uh, talking about the need for immigration reform uh, and but at the same time, we also believe we can get a little bit more involved uh, when it comes to practical uh, needs that need to be met for these uh, amazing people along the border. And so we have really uh, restructured our organization actually a year ago on what, how can we lead with uh, water? How can we lead with providing food uh, for these communities on a consistent basis uh, so that we can gather progressives, conservatives, whoever may be, um, to, to come partner with us to love and care for uh, Latinos, immigrants, migrants, and asylum seekers along the border. And so we're doing that work. Currently, we're in five communities along the border. Uh, we're, we're currently doing a lot of work in Reynosa, Mexico, as there are 2,000 plus asylum seekers living in tents in a plaza there. Uh, and we're providing a meal every day for around 1,000 plus uh, asylum seekers and providing water uh, for the entire community um, every uh, single day. And so uh, it's, been a, it's been a huge uh, blessing for me uh, just to be a part of the work that we're, we're doing. And um, yeah, we're, the, the work is always needed. There's always another community. And so we're just trying our best to um, steward uh, what we have to care for those in need. Awesome, thank you. Um... Something that uh, I was looking at on the website and then you were talking about like the different areas that you serve. And um, I saw that a lot of them are like border communities between Texas and Mexico. And then um, the city of West Los Guatales uh, in mm -hmm. El Salvador. So um, what is it about those four cities specifically? And is it um, there specifically um, have a lack of water? Or is it just um, what was what was the development behind those different cities that y'all served? Yeah, um, we oftentimes get uh, a lot of emails and uh, uh, you know phone calls from communities in need, 
um, uh, around the, uh, and along the border. And so um, we, we strategically as a team uh, pick these, these communities um, so that we can help them create some kind of long-term sustainability in their communities. Um, one of the strategic things we do at the Immigration Coalition is we don't go into a community and say, hey, we're the Immigration Coalition, here's how you need to do things. <laughs> We, that, that's just terrible approach when it comes to caring for a community. We go into the community after they have reached out and we build relationship for months um, and we identify key leaders, maybe a church pastor or leader, um, maybe just a spiritual community leader that, been, that has been there for years. And uh, because they have trust in that community, we're able to come alongside and say, how can we better help this community with clean water and food. And it allows us going forward to, to, to build that relationship and um, to allow us, again, like many people on the ground that we're serving, they know about the Immigration Coalition, but they primarily know about the leaders who have been there for years. Um, and so it allows them to trust what we're doing even more um, so that we can create a long-term uh, approach to caring, to caring for them. Uh, we identified these communities because we felt that, that was, those were the communities that we wanted to be in partnership with long term and to serve with long term. Um, and passionately, we're, we're, we care about Latinos and immigrants and migrants and asylum seeking communities. Um, the problem is I, I can't say yes to every community, but as we continue to grow, we want to continue to do that work. And then when it comes to El Salvador, um, you know, sometimes there's communities that they might feel like they're forced to come to the U.S. to, to seek asylum and make that strenuous journey uh, because one, the U.S. Embassy takes forever to, to, to get back to them when they try to request asylum and so they want to take that strenuous journey or sometimes it's because they don't have food or clean water and so we identified 12 colonial communities around each other and we said what if we built a well but not only built the well what does it look like for us to equip the well to have piping and plumbing that goes into every single home in these communities where they have access to clean water at their disposal? And so we're actually trying to invest even in the economy of those countries like El Salvador. Um, so folks who were otherwise felt forced to leave can say, oh, I actually can have a better opportunity to maybe stay because, because we now have clean drinking water. And so we're trying to deal both and work. How do we care for those who are coming and feeling like they're fleeing persecution, pain, strife, uh, a lack of security, and those who are like, well, um, I could stay if I had clean water. How do we do that? And how do we care for them? And I think building the well uh, and, and providing food in those countries is also a benefit as well. Yeah, for sure. I remember um, recently I had to carry a bucket of water a few feet. And I realized it was maybe five gallons that I realized like two steps and I couldn't carry the whole thing. And it's <laughs> because it, I mean, just thinking about transportation of it's, it's so heavy. It's a very dense sort of substance, but it's the most vital substance on earth, you know? And so mm -hmm. um, I can understand why piping and plumbing would be a reason for people to stay, you know, even if, even if a lot of other things are going wrong at least having it's, water yeah especially for pregnant mothers elderly in the community i mean you have you have you can build a well but if it's if it's three or four miles away from a community then they're not going to have a, an opportunity like a younger family might have to access clean water and so we invested a little bit more of our funds to say how can we fully equip it um, holistically so that they can have access to water in their own community and home um, and, and how can we, you know, we just actually just had the, the ceremony yesterday of, and ribbon cutting of like, you know, it's, it's ready to go for the community yesterday and, and it was awesome. And so our hope is that we can continue to do that in many ways. And I think it dabbles and, and touches on immigration in, in many ways. Uh, people leave, the, leave their home countries because of security and a lack of opportunity. Those are the two economic opportunity. Those are the two biggest reasons I believe they they seek asylum um, and, and make that strenuous journey. So for those who do want to stay and we can maybe make it a little bit better for them to access a, li a normal life, we want to do that. And at the same time, those who feel like they have to come, they can come and they have a right to seek asylum at the U.S.-Mexico border and we'll be there to care for them too. That's awesome that 
you all have a really holistic approach because I think that's, you know, a big problem with the NGOs and government organizations is there there isn't really like a a unification to it and so i'm really glad that organizations like yours can can be like a literal bridge you know between countries Mm. and and communities and and, uh, people with different abilities and life situations like we're saying with Mm -hmm. elderly people and uh, people who are pregnant and everything so exactly uh, yeah um so that's sort of brings me to uh, my third question, which is about um, the providing material aid for people. So we, as the American Solidarity Party, believe that, um, you know, people have material needs, you know, it's, that's even a psychological fact. I have a background in psychology, and that's the most basic need that we have. So how do how does the immigration coalition practice the sort of corporal works of mercy to assist others? I think you went into this a little bit, but, um, you know, feeding yeah. the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, things like that. Yeah. And as an organization that's faith-based, we, we try to take into account the, um, you know, Matthew 25, you know, when Jesus says, well, I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink, I needed clothes and you clothed me. Um, we're trying to take into account that our faith, no matter what faith you come from, it should always lead to action toward loving the vulnerable um, from the womb to the tomb, right? And so, and that's what I've appreciated about the American Solidarity Party. And so for us, you know, I, I love the work that we do because when you care for immigrants along the border or even in El Salvador, you can't help but be pro-life from the womb to the tomb and show that mercy from because you're dealing with elderly, you're dealing with unborn babies in a mother's womb, you're dealing with children, you're dealing with fathers, you're dealing with mothers, you're dealing with the whole spectrum of human beings that deserve mercy and deserve care um, and and love. Um, and so um, we we have really taken into account the importance of what that looks like and how do we continue to do that work um, in a, on a consistent basis uh, for folks in in need, and so um, we're we're co- we're continuing to con- to do as much mercy work as we can along the border. Um, again, there's we're just I feel like sometimes we're just scratching the surface. Uh, there's so many communities in need, and so as we continue to grow, uh, our our hope is that we can continue to ad- identify more communities. To show more more mercy to and more love and more care for. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that the organization sort of not only does it have the holistic approach in an international sense, but also in an interpersonal sense. You know, within and between all humans, and um, really advocating for um, providing for material needs because that does respect the inherent dignity of each person. So I really appreciate that. Um, And so I guess in that vein, what do you think are some practical steps that voters in the US um, who are part of the ASP um, and then people who are public servants, especially um, ASP members and anyone really who's already in public office, maybe as an independent or whatever political affiliation what can they do to, and what can we do to advocate for fair and merciful uh, immigration policy? Because in, you know, in your bio, it, it talked about, um, you know, respecting um, laws and also respecting dignity and, and trying to find a balance for that, um, and specifically for the state level. So I guess like advocating for, uh, fair policy on the state level. So I guess that would mostly apply to border states, um, but any states really. Yeah, so how can people advocate is what you're asking. Yeah, I I would say, I mean, you you can always call your representatives and I think that's needed. Um, You know, the the more their constituents hear about a particular topic, the more they're gonna have to become passionate about that topic even if they don't want to, because they want that vote when they when their re-election comes up, 
Um, and so I think it's, it's important to consistently visit and call our representatives and Google. If you don't know your representative, Google your local representative. I, I tell people that one of the most powerful tools on how to care for immigrants is Google. And you can just go there and you can also say, where, where are local immigration organizations near me? And then get in proximity with immigrants as well and asylum seekers and refugees. What does it look like to care for them in your own community near, near you? I always tell people proximity always breeds deep empathy and compassion for others. And so what does it look like for us to get in more proximity to immigrants, to hear their story, to learn their story, to care for them and love them? Because not only is advocacy a part of helping to change laws to become more just and fair and balanced, but also I think advocacy is getting to know an immigrant's name, getting to know a refugee's name and hearing about who they are as a human being and caring for them. And not only just caring about them, but learning from them. I, I, as a as a someone who's from a faith perspective and as a Christian, I believe God oftentimes ordains immigrants to come to this country to show what what it looks like to actually have a strong faith in the Lord because of the experiences that they've that they've gone through. Um, and so I, I think those are those are a couple of ways. I also think it, it's important to to make sure that as uh, we have to understand that we do need immigration reform that does secure our borders and shows compassion. We can't just choose one side or the other. I think the American Solidarity Party does a great job of this. How can we strike that balance and live in that tension of, there are there is human trafficking, there is drug trafficking. The work that we're doing along the Southern border in Reynosa right now, I just got off the phone a, a couple hours ago uh, about the cartel that was literally trying to human traffic and a couple kids have gone missing already in the tent camp that we're serving food at because there is drug trafficking, human trafficking going on. So how do we implement border security in a multifaceted way that does keep out drugs and human trafficking and allows us at the same time to strengthen our care and our love for those asylum seekers in need of refuge in the U.S., in need of care and in need of a, a new life in the U.S., and at the same time, uh, making sure that we help those 11 million undocumented immigrants come out of the shadows, get right with the law, maybe pay a, a restitution kind of base uh, fine. And then they're allowed to stay in the country because oftentimes we see it over and over in, in, in studies, immigrants make America even safer and a better place to be. Um, but this does not negate that we also understand that there's always a few bad apples in every group. And so we need to make sure that we're doing both and. And so that's hard because I think it's easy in America to choose one side or the other. It's easy to just say border security, border security, they're all criminals. Generalizing is an easy thing to do. Or the other side, everybody deserves, we just need open borders. Everybody deserves come, to come into the country. Well, that's an easy thing to do too, but it's not, it's not that simple. We can't generalize everybody. We have to live in that tension of, we do need to implement border security, but at the same time, we also need to make sure that we're showing compassion. And the logistics of that is we can disagree on what that looks like, especially when it comes to border security. But I always tell people, we can't disagree that we can't, that we, that we have to love and care for people creating God's image, which is vitally important. Yeah, that especially makes sense with the, the issue of the state level policy, I think um, saying, you know, we do need to still be, um, we, we need to have a policy. It can't just be completely um, a free for all because, you know, there are people who live on the border who don't want um, human trafficking and, and drugs to become the norm in their, in their city. And obviously that could, that could happen or that could not happen, but it is important to consider that you know, the federal government shouldn't have like absolute control, you know, um, and there, there should be some level of, uh, you know, uh, respect for the differences between border states and non-border states and, and any, um, and it, it's easy for anybody to talk, talk about, oh yeah, well, we can have open borders. And it's another thing if you live in 
one of those areas, you know, and, and you have your own people to to look out for, and you don't you know want some sort of um, crime to happen. But then at the same time, like you were saying, um, I was reading statistics that you know um, undocumented immigrants have some of the lowest crime rates, um, and yes. it's even lower than America, you know, than um, citizens, you know, U.S. citizens yep. and legal immigrants actually as well. It's their their crime rate is lower, and so exactly it is. Um, it's a really um, difficult topic to grapple with. Um, I also appreciated what you said about, um, you know, the the proximity because that really ties into um, in Catholic social teaching and uh, which uh, the ASP talks a lot about with subsidiarity, where you're you're really reaching out to your your local community first. And um, you know, I have family who uh, have volunteered at local um, immigration sort of clinics and things like that. And it's it's really moving to see what they've learned through that and how that really changes you when, when all that you have to do is take the time to get to know one person or one family and exactly. how that really changes you. So um, I guess in uh, moving from the state to the federal, what do you think uh, personally, we believe that the federal government should do to resolve some of the pressing issues at the border, like detention centers and water scarcity, um, like this president in particular, or just the federal government in general. What can we do better? Yeah, I think like what are what are good policies to reform? What are things that the Biden administration can do or that the federal government in general. Yeah, I, I, I personally, you know, we're actually providing food and water for a local hotel that I can't say the specific location. And oftentimes when they, when they, when asylum seekers come across the border and they're put into a hotel for a certain amount of time, especially the children, um, they usually give nobody access to care for them, but we were able to somehow get access and we've been providing food with them, for them every day. Um, and caring for them. And I think for, from what I've seen, we have to do a better job of, they're not, we have to do a better job of treating them like humans. And we have to, we have to, I think a lot of times America is reactive to what's going on at the border instead of proactive. And so it, it kind of dawns on me that I don't understand why Biden didn't, didn't why they, why the Biden administration didn't uh, foresee that him coming on as president was going to bring another surge at the border. It was going to happen. Everybody knew. <laughs> so there was, it seemed like there wasn't really a plan in place to establish a, 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 a structurized pattern or step process for those asylum seeking unaccompanied minor children coming across the border to help them establish some kind of lifestyle and growth in America. It feels like they're still trying to figure out what that looks like. So we need a better step, step-by-step -step process on what that looks like. Because if we're going to allow unaccompanied minors to come into the country, which I believe it's over 20,000 now, and they're staying in hotels and detention centers, whatever it may be, we need to be better prepared to, to care for them in a way that gives them dignity so that they can get out of detention, right? And not just live there or living in a hotels and establish a better process for them to grow and to become uh, uh, educated, to become uh, folks who grow up and can help um, and be, be, become you know, humans who are doing great jobs uh, and, and living a great life here in, in America. I don't think we've done that well. Um, and what we see also is, uh, what we see is under, under Trump, you know, he used a lot of what was going on as his as his mantra and banner for his policies and how he became president. Um, and then under Biden, it's been, you know, there's been some kind of stuff, there's been stuff that he has done that has been gracious and good. But it, what we're seeing is immigration, it has been broken for 30 plus years. And being broken under the, even people that I know who voted for Biden, why hasn't, you know, there have been better steps toward immigration reform? Why? It's because, Every for years and years, even before Trump, it has become this complex, tangled ball of yarn immigration that they cannot untangle. And the only way to do that 
is not in four years, it's not in eight years, it's over a time of consistency with these, with whether Republican or Democrat trying to unravel what has, what, what administrations have put together <laughs> over time that has dehumanized people and has dehumanized immigrants and refugees and, and asylum seekers. And that's what we're seeing under the Biden administration. They're doing some good, but what we're seeing is there's, there's, there's still issues going on and there's still surge going on at the border and it's not consistent and there's, there, there needs to be a change in what that looks like. There has to be a better approach to how we treat people and care for them. Um, and so I just think it's, it's vital. I hope that answers yeah. the question. Yeah, no, for sure. It just, something I've noticed is um, like you were saying, it, it has been around, you know, over 30 years, um, really since the Clinton administration and things like that, when it started to really be an issue because um, the border was like relatively open um, before then and everything. But um, it almost seems like sort of an executive tennis match where every four or eight years, it's just, you know, changed and changed and changed. And it's all these executive orders and nobody even really knows how, um, what the legal weight of executive orders are. You know, they're, they're very um, ethereal and uh, sort of uh, interesting issue in the law because they're not really law, but they kind of are. And so um, mm -hmm. I guess with that, it seems like it, it needs to be a change, not only in like executive laws, but also just in the American legal code in general of, of how we deal with it, because otherwise it's just every four or eight years, it's going to change so much that there's never going to be any stability. Um, and it, it seems and like it needs to be sort of a collaboration. And one of the best processes to, to help establish a better process of immigration reform, which is, uh, I think Kent, he, he asked a question about, um, you know, thoughts on comprehensive immigration reform. One of the, there's tons of steps we have to take allowing DACA recipients to get right with, to get right with the law, giving them U.S. citizenship, undocumented immigrants coming out of the shadows, helping those pay fine, get right with the law and, and have, uh, you know, U.S. citizenship over time, uh, securing ports of entry and the border in a multifaceted approach. One of the best ways I think we can help, we can help establish um, the influx of immigrants and, and asylum seekers coming to the border is we have to do a better job, I believe, um, of America uh, helping those countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, um, helping them to establish consistent uh, asylum seeking processing centers in their own country, where the people will hear back in two months after they, they try to seek asylum in their own, ho own home country. We need to help them use some of their foreign aid money. We give hundreds of millions of dollars to these countries. Oftentimes you can't even research and find what is it, how is this money being used? And a lot of times, if you even read the history of Latin America, the governments even in, within those own countries are corrupt. <laughs> and oftentimes they get in trouble because they're using some of those funds and funds that they are, have been allocated for their own pockets in partnership with the cartel. It's just a mess. And so how can we help establish a better accountability structure to help them establish asylum seeking processing centers in their own country where the asylum seekers can can trust the process that they're going to hear back on a consistent in a consistent uh, time frame frame like two weeks couple months whatever it may be and it's a consistent uh, time frame where they're not going to make the strenuous journey to the border so, some of them right it cuts the number um, and they can hear back and stay in their own country until they can hear if they have been approved or not. That allows a certain number to stay back and stay safe and not make the strenuous journey to the border. And then it also allows those who really are fleeing persecution, those who are really needing to get out of uh, whatever uh, in insecurity or pain or violence they're trying to flee, and they're able to come to the border and we're able to, to be able to handle that number of people coming on a in, a in a more pro-life and healthy way. I feel like that's one of the best approaches we can do um, is being able to establish those asylum seeking refugee processing centers. And I think I heard the USCIS even talk about what that looks like. I have, they, they talked about it a couple months ago 
but I haven't seen any action on what that on, on them establishing something like that. But I believe that's a that's a that's a great way to start so that we can keep families safe, so that we can as a country handle the influx of thousands of immigrants coming, maybe the numbers shorten. Um, and then we even show more grace toward those who are at the border. And we can say, man, that you actually came that far. You have to be fleeing something violent. You have to be fleeing something painful. How can we care for you? How can we love you? Um, and how can we help you seek refuge in this country? Yeah, I really appreciate that you approached it in that way. Um, Cause yeah, I was gonna ask you about like comprehensive reforms. And I really think that does achieve a comprehensive approach because it isn't, you're right. It isn't just about like, okay, we're just gonna fix everything. It's a blanket fix because that's not how politics works. That's not how humanity works. There's never gonna be a blanket fix for everything. And especially in a, a two-party system, you know, there's never going to be something that really pleases everyone. And so I love that that's like a proposal of yours is, you know, trying to fix what we can and reduce the number of people who need, you know, that in the first place so that there is more room freed up, so to speak. Not that, not that it's zero sum game really, but um, that, yeah, it, you get, you do, it is something that we can then sort through in a more orderly manner. And it's not, you know, it's not as much a, um, so, so overwhelming to um, any government system that, um, that they just, you know, say an all out rejection, like we're just closing, we're just shutting everything down, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really appreciate that. That's, that's, that's like Kim um, just said. Uh, it's good that there can't say other are there members of Congress agreeable to work on this right now. And one of the biggest reasons why immigration reform won't get passed, unborn babies aren't protected the way they should be, even pregnant mothers are, are seen as evil, terrible people when they're contemplating abortion, when they need more social programs to care for them and love them, is because we have a problem in Washington. We have a political party pro problem. The two party system is jacked up. And that's why there, you're seeing so many people and the American Solidarity Party growing because you people are tired of the two party system because nothing's getting done. And instead of working together in Washington, both Congress, Republican senators on both sides of the aisle, they're just jawing at each other and pointing fingers. And you see that often. I mean, we saw that in January, February, March, when when uh, when the children were coming to the border and company children and all those Republican senators went to act and call out President Biden as if he was horrible and evil. And even though I agree that it was wrong that that there has been, they have been detained in, in some places that aren't healthy, it sounded so hypocritical because they were also praising President Trump for establishing family separation during their tenure. And so I always tell people, political allegiance is blinding. And that's what has been happening for so many years. People have put, placed their identity and hope in these two political parties and congressmen and senators, it feels like they're not doing anything enough to get something right, to compromise and work together for the people of America and um, immigrants. They're just looking out for themselves, their votes and their party. And that's why you see people like myself become politically homeless. People who are saying I'm politically agnost agnostic. People who are saying I'm going to the American Solidarity Party because they're the most uh, pro-life from the womb to the tomb party. And that's what I think is so important and good about what's happening with the American Solidarity Party is there's, there's, there's starting to be a little nudge in this. I think there's more people out there who are more pro-life from the womb to the tomb and tired of the two-party system. And I think this has a great way to continue to grow so that we can help knock down doors and make Congress and senators actually work together. That's my rant. <laughs> no i i think it's it's a really good point because um i think there's just a lot of people that are very disillusioned and it's gotten to the point in our nation where i think there's just been cognitive dissonance for so long where you just kind of have to drink the kool-aid of this party or that party because that's all you can do and so you might as well justify yourself in one party or the other and say well i don't like this this and this but this issue is more important to me. And I appreciate that um, parties like the ASP and also just like small parties in general give people the chance to 
really stand for what they believe without having to compromise as much. And I mean, there's definitely always some things that, you know, people will have to compromise on because they, they have their priority. They have their list of priorities, you know, like for some people, it would be life issues for some people be environmental or immigration or things like that. And so, um, I think like it's, it's important not just to push the ASP as like this ultimate party, but just the more parties that we can use to crowd out the two parties, it's like, you know, sort of suffocating out a fire, you know, it's like, you just have to like put a bunch of blankets on it. So it's like, you know, the more, mm -hmm. the more we can come from different sides of, of sort of breaking the two party system, the better. And um, it will and be think, more messy. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think you what we're seeing you what we saw on all the news stations when they figured out how they couldn't figure out when when the election results happened, they couldn't figure out the Latino vote, they were blown away that in Florida and along the border, it was the highest percentage of Latinos voting for President Trump. And then because, and they thought they were gonna vote for the other side. So one of the biggest things I think is, is what's happening is uh, there's a huge opportunity for parties like the American Solidarity Party to try to take advantage of identifying the Latino vote, identifying those who are, there are far more people who I think who are in the middle and trying to figure out what party to go to and then they don't go to no party or they don't vote because they don't want to vote for either party, their Democratic or Republican party, because it doesn't truly represent them. So there's a huge opportunity to tackle and tap into that space to, to really be pro-life from the womb to the tomb. And although I don't think any party is going to be perfect and someone's going to agree with everything, um, one, of the, one of the healthy things is I think the American Solidarity Party has allowed people to be uh, more comfortable with saying, I may disagree with a few things here, but man, I, they're, they're getting at something that I think the country needs. Um, and so I think that's, I think that's vital because the two party system is always just gonna play to their, their sides. They're gonna, they, the extremism on both sides, but I think we need a balance. I think we need a healthy tension balance um, of the both and on so many issues. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think it's um something that I, I think I was reading and I could be wrong. I think I was reading that less than half of Americans actually voted in the last election. So um, yeah. that really tells you like we have so much, we have so many resources really of people who just are, you know, very, very done with it. And they're done with politics. They're done with the way that it is happening right now. And so that's really an untapped resource. Um, we don't even have to, we don't even have to worry about changing anyone's minds. All we have to do, if we have 60% of the population that's still not aligned, then that means that we have the majority. It means we have like exactly. the ability to tip the balance. So exactly, um, exactly. Yeah. Um, also, uh, so we have about seven minutes more of our discussion time. And then after that, we're gonna open it to questions. So if y'all wanna start sending in those questions and then at around 11.45 Eastern time, we can start taking those. I just wanted y'all to be able to start thinking of them. Um, and then my next question for you, Rondell, is um, how should we, you know, we, we definitely covered this a lot, but what do you think is the best way to balance respecting human dignity and respecting laws and do you think that there's ever a need to engage in nonviolent civil disobedience to um sort of combat like unjust laws you know like thomas aquinas and unjust laws no law at all sort of thing and um obviously that worked during the civil rights movement but you know i guess at what point do we consider immigration to be civil rights and things like that yeah, I mean, that, that gets complex because I think there's so many, like you said, executive orders and laws going on. And, and, and so, you know, you, you have to sift through which ones should be obeyed, which ones shouldn't. Um, for me, I've gotten to the point where I'm like, if I'm, I'm someone who believes in border security. I believe in respecting the governing authorities. But that does never mean, that does not mean that we can't advocate to change legislation for border security. 
oftentimes you'll hear people say, just respect the rule of law, get in line at your, at the, uh, in your own country. And that just tells me right off the bat, they don't know the immigration system. They don't understand that there's not even a line out there. Um, and so it's, it's, as someone of, of faith, I firmly believe that the, the, the rule of law should be obeyed, but it also means it needs to be changed. So what does that mean for me? If someone comes undocumented, my first reaction is not get, get in line, go back to your country. My first reaction is mercy, like we were talking about earlier, grace. What happened? Can I, can I get to know you? My job is to, do you need some food? Do you need some water? And then maybe we can figure this out and see them as human beings because oftentimes people, people love the law so much and believe every law should be obeyed, even if they're unjust, that they'll see those who do come undocumented and they'll see them as criminals and evil people. And they literally will think the, uh, an offense of coming across the border the first time is literally a federal crime when it's not, it's a misdemeanor. It's as if like I was gonna, when I drive out of here and I, I stop for one second at the stop sign instead of three seconds and I get stopped by the cop. I'm not gonna go to jail, I'm not gonna go to prison. <laughs> And, and my wife and people are not going to see me as an evil person who's a, who's a crazy criminal. And so I think our understanding of the law needs to be reformed and deformed in many ways. Um, and so I think, I think it's important that we do have border security. But what I, when I tell people that I, what I mean is we need, to, we need to change the laws. It needs to be more fair at the border. We have to do that because what's happening at the border with so many families and human trafficking and drug trafficking, it's so messy. It's just showing that we do need border security, but at the same time, we need to make sure that we're showing compassion and love. I think when we have a healthy approach to border security, a multi, I always say multifaceted approach because I believe there's a multifaceted approach with technology and ports of entry, technology along the border, augmented barriers that need to be restructured and changed. I think there are some areas that probably need to have uh, a barrier uh, because there is human trafficking and drug trafficking going on. And I don't want asylum seekers to be brought into the country, trafficked and drugs brought into the country where they can hurt Americans. Um, and so with that, we, I think when we do that, that, we're able to show compassion to a mother and who has, who's pregnant with a child. And when we're protecting our country, we can easily say that this person is a human being who deserves refuge. How is this person going to be a, a, a terrible person who is going to hurt my country? They need refuge and care and love. Um, and so I think that's a huge way for us. So we as, we as people, and I think the American Solidarity Party would agree, we have to establish border security and we have to learn how to show compassion. So we have to start with those conversations. And what that means is we need to be willing to compromise and disagree um, but I think, I think we can get there if we're willing to have those healthy conversations uh, when it comes to doing both and. And I think it's healthy. We need it. And it would help America. So my, that's, that's my hope, right? That's my hope. And while we're doing that, my organization, we want to provide food and water and clothing and whatever is needed in the meantime. I think that's a great way to approach it, you know, because uh, we can we can talk politics all day, you know, at the end of the day, politics is about human beings and, and the government is created to serve human beings. It's created to sort of be a, um, you know, what it's, it's supposed to protect and advocate for, and, and it's not the other way around. It's not people, you know, bowing to the almighty government. It's, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it's a both and situation. So, um, that can kind of bring us into one of our Q and A's, um, which is uh, I'm probably not saying this right, but Merhawi Tafai, Tafai, um, do you think that we can work to make sure that entering this country without documents can, at the very least, become a minor infraction and not a felony? Yeah, I think that's important. I, I think, like I said earlier, when someone comes the first time without documents and gets gets caught. Uh, which oftentimes what I've noticed is asylum seekers who do come across the border, the, what they do is oftentimes they go straight to border patrol and they go to the, the closest police station. They don't want to come undocumented. They really want to seek refuge so they can be here documented. So that's a that's a, an assumption when people think that they just come here and just avoid you know police and they actually want to get caught so they can actually 
uh, have a process to stay here safely. Um, I would say that we do, I think there is a way that we can do that. I think what we need to do is we have, we need to have a better relationship with these countries to have a background information on, on people who come undocumented. And so if someone does come undocumented, I think based on their back history in a country, so let's say it's a, it's a guy who there's been a couple stories where someone has smuggled a kid, come to the border, acted like they're his, they're their dad, um, but they're actually drug trafficking, human trafficking that child. Well, based on that background history and him doing that, it would, I, I believe it would need to be a felony because he does not need a human traffic and bring a kid like that. And that's a crime to, to do that, that's wrong. But if it was somebody who it came undocumented and it's a mother with a child and two kids and they're fleeing persecution and we look at their background history and we're able to, to, to see that they're good people in their country, they're actually fleeing uh, persecution. We're able to hear their story, understand that they're really seeking and trying to uh, just have a better life in America. Then it shouldn't. It shouldn't even be a minor infraction. We should allow them to come in and bring them and give them refuge. And so I think it's a both end. We have to. We have to be willing as a country, and that's why I think even we need better judges and better people at the border who can who can um, review folks and their um, their petitions because we have to take every immigrant and asylum seeker um, as, a, as, as a case by case basis. Everybody has a different story, everybody has a different narrative. And based on that story, narrative and background, that's how we best apply justice to them. So yes, we do need to do that, I think. That'd be important. Yeah, it seems like that would really involve um, a concerted effort, not just with the US government, but also with, um, governments in Central and South America that obviously a lot of them are corrupt, as you were saying, with, um, you know, political favors and um, self-serving through uh, the, the positions and everything. But um, ideally something where we could work out a system where um, we have background checks and things that can cross borders more easily and, and that can really show this person has nothing on their record or the only thing on their record was some traffic violations or, or exactly. things like that, you know. When you don't have a background history on somebody, then you're always going to have suspicion. I always, then again, it goes back to the exact, I said this the other day, uh, it, you know, proximity breeds compassion and love for others. Uh, distance breeds gossip and, and suspicion and assumption. And so when most of the time when people are assuming and generalizing all asylum seekers and immigrants as all criminals trying to break the law, trying to mess up the country, it's because they have yet to ever be in proximity with someone who is an immigrant or asylum seeker. Most people who actually get in proximity with these people, their hearts are always changed for the better. And then they start thinking there has to be a better way than the way that I'm thinking about these people because they're humans just like me. And I think we have to understand that and believe that when it comes to um, asylum seekers. It is a human being issue first before it's political. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I think that's something I was um, listening to a podcast recently, and it was saying that um, something that we can really do it um, just in society is, you know, having discussions like this um, and really encountering each other through narrative rather than just through laws and, and um, you know, really um, like all this written word. Um, is, is a very like westernized um, sort of approach and, and narrative is a very transcultural approach. And it's, um, it's something that I think we can really recapture is, is encountering three people by hearing their story and um, really listening to, you know, what they have, what they've gone through and what, what they hope, what they hope for and what they're seeking. Exactly, a hundred percent. And that's why I think, Again, I appreciate the American Solidarity Party because it, when we do that, like you're saying, the narrative, that's gonna take hard work. <laughs> it's easy work to generalize. It's easy work to be on the extremes. That's easy. It's hard to live in that tension of how do we figure out border security? And at the same time, how do we figure out how to be compassionate to those, those who deserve it and need it? That's hard. It's hard for me to always think about. <laughs> um, and in hearing their narrative, right, in their story, it takes it takes an effort on our part 
to really get our hands dirty and really learn um, and really being willing to, to, to listen, to compromise, to disagree, still be kind and loving to one another. And that's, that's my hope. Um, because if we ever want to fix immigration and, and have immigration reform, it's going to take those things. Absolutely. Um, are there any more questions that y'all have? Um, you've been pretty quiet, but. Uh, I think I answered like five of them while we were talking. So right. it was simultaneously in the Q&A. <laughs> My bad. Okay. Oh, I see a bunch. Okay. I didn't see all these. Um, did you, did you see, Rondell, did you see any others that I didn't see? I didn't see all these for now, but. Um, these are it, the ones I said answered. Okay. I tried to answer while we were talking. Yeah. But I appreciate those questions and people being engaged. That, those are great mm -hmm. questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, something that, let's see, something I was wondering is if you have, let's see, I have a few right now. Um, So ASP is really oriented towards like action and, and getting things done and everything, which, you know, in the, in the last panel, Tim, Tim Wainwright um, has this whole website about, um, you know, policies that are really practical and, and that we could um, implement and actually, rather than just abstract ideas and everything. So um, we try to promote corporal works of mercy, as we've talked about, and um, so I'm wondering if there was like one piece of advice that you could leave with us to help promote the better treatment of immigrants on like a societal level or government level. So, like, what would what, what do you think that would be? Like on the from the government perspective, like from a yeah, government or just like society, I guess too. Um, either way. Yeah, I, I think when it comes to when it comes to, I would say I, I would say from a government perspective, from a hundred thousand foot level, um, I think one of the practical ways is um, advocating locally with advocacy organizations in your city and town on what on basic uh, human rights for immigrants. Maybe it's DACA recipients. You know, when I was in when I lived in Memphis uh, a couple years ago. Um, you know, we, we were helping DACA recipients get scholarships because they, it's hard for them to get in-state tuition. So things like that, that are practical on the ground, um, grassroots, uh, being able to, to, to talk to some of your city council members who oftentimes will, will sponsor scholarships for, for DACA recipients. Um, uh, I tell people often that immigrants, even one of the advocacy ways also, um, you know, continuing to call your representatives. I think that's so important is continuing to pester them <laughs> um, about the need for, for immigration reform and the better treatment of, of immigrants. And then I think on a practical level, I think it's partnering with and, and seeking out organizations that are doing practical work of advocacy, such as the Immigration Coalition, providing clean water on a consistent basis for thousands of immigrants and migrants and asylum seekers along the border. Um, uh, and, and in Latin America, uh, figuring out ways to financially partner with us, talk to us, help us, you know, help us uh, to get the word out on how we can even help other organizations continue to do practical work. Because I think there's a both end. You have to call, you have to call your representatives. We have to meet and advocate for better legislation. But in the meantime, there's somebody in need of food and water right now. So that's going to be a long work. The legislation piece right that's oftentimes the wheels of justice oftentimes move slow and it's needed but we also need to be figuring out well somebody needs water and food and clothing right now so how do we do that right now or tutoring at a local immigration organization that's helping kids have better grades in school stuff like that so doing those both doing both and i think that's a great way to advocate You're on mute, Mary. 
sorry. Um, no, you're okay. So yeah, no, you're good. Um, it's just, I appreciate that because it, it reflects ASP principles and everything and um, of sort of having that whole life um, approach to it with, you know, kids needing to get educated and everything. So um, I'm looking through the um, questions and everything. And um, I think it's interesting because uh, Dr. Hannick um, said, talked about the Catholic worker movement in Houston and Casa Juan Diego. Um, I uh, went to a talk by someone from there a few years ago. And um, I think that's something that um, it would be really interesting to try and see is, is having a um, sort of a network of, of similar organizations um, and trying to connect them so that um, between um, the U.S. and other countries too, so that even if it's like in my organization or your organization, you know, um, or this or that one, they might not necessarily have that um, mm. have that reach across. But if if we connect between organizations, um, that that might also be a, a help. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think in, in other words, like networking with and being in having a network of organizations doing good work together is always important. Um, that's a there, that's a need because I think there's so many things that we can there's so many things to do when it comes to immigration. You can just specifically advocate for DACA recipients. You can advocate for um, you know local legislation for in-state tuition for undocumented immigrants, DACA recipients. Uh, there's so many things and focus points. Uh, for that I think that we can if we can all connect and be in partnership together then we're able to help each other um, whenever our communities in need and then rally together right and actually really make noise and I, I think there's 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 some of that going on in local areas around the around the country um, I haven't seen anything that has been national but, but I would be interested to see if that could be a possibility because you can make more noise for legislation and you can make more noise to, to um, you know, uh, advocacy and urging Congress and centers to do things and, and enact things legislatively that is fair and loving toward immigrants and migrants and asylum seekers. Yeah, I think that's especially important because there's, you know, around 11 million undocumented people and they they feel like they have no voice you know and, and advocacy means you know like giving a voice or being a voice and everything so um that's definitely i think something that could help with um, unifying different charitable and governmental organizations is that it it would help with um giving a voice to people who feel like to uh like they're not safe in speaking up for themselves or, or for one another. So um, I think that's definitely um, an unfilled need. And I like what you said too about the national, on the national level, because I think that can really help with um, getting things done in Congress, you know, and, and we have all these different like lobbies for different, you know, special interests and stuff. Why can't immigration be a special interest? You know, why can't, mm -hmm. why can't, um, asylum seekers and everything. So, um, and not just from, you know, um, not just from Central South America necessarily, but, you know, if, if people from all over the world, you know, united and, and said like, we need, we need this to be uh, a line item issue um, in Congress, then, then maybe that could actually happen someday, so. Exactly, I agree 100%, yeah. you're right, that's good. So um, I think that's uh, about our time. Let's see, we have one more question, I think. Um, more of a statement. Okay, yeah. Um, but yes, I'm sorry, Kathy, that you have to go through that. So. Yeah, I think that's about our time. Um, Thank you so much for uh, all your I thoughts. I, I really learned a lot and um, I hope that the audience did. And um, I'm just really thankful that we could do this today and I'm looking forward to the rest of the conference as well. Um, and I think you're yeah. speaking later tonight, right? I am, so awesome. I'll see y'all later tonight. <laughs> awesome, all right. <laughs>
Well, thank you all so much. All right. Um, well, y'all be safe. Thank you for the questions. Appreciate you, Mary, moderating. I know that's tough and it can be difficult, but you did a great job. And uh, yeah, I'll see y'all tonight.